Okay, I'll take this one. Um, so we're looking at either pretty big punch or maybe small excision. Um, right away, you're seeing kind of these most likely vascular proliferations in the dermis because you can already see the extravasated res and um, and uh, red blood cells that look like they're still in vessel. So thinking this is, you know, uh, vascular proliferation um, right off the bat, um, I, you could think of, I think, like a glomeruloid hemangioma, but I think those are supposed to be more um, like in crescent type shapes um, and they're kind of like protruding into that which you don't really see here um, these look more like well there's some areas that look more like the cannonball tufts mm -hmm. um, of vessels so I think I would be at this point probably leaning more towards the tufted angioma yeah very good <laughs> I, this is uh, either you can call it a tufted angioma or a Kaposi-form hemangioendothelioma. Those are two uh, names for basically the same tumor or the same spectrum of tumors. People, people have debated over that a lot over the years, but really the when they're large lesions that are larger and, and more infiltrative and deeper, particularly in babies or, or having been present since uh, infancy, we tend to use the term Kaposi-form hemangioendothelioma. When they're small, uh, lesions in the skin of adults, we tend to use the term tufted angioma. But honestly, I when I sign these out, I usually put, you know, composed form of angioendothelioma slash tufted angioma with the comment that these, in the WHO soft tissue book at least, they, they are basically on a spectrum. And my mentor, Dr. Weiss, said that they look essentially identical microscopically. So the real the real difference in the naming there is that in when they're large and in babies particularly, they have a tendency to do this thing where they trap platelets in these little these little whorled nodules of spindle cells and compressed vascular channels. And that's called Casabac Merritt syndrome, and that can lead to thrombocytopenia. And in a subset of patients, that can be very serious and even potentially fatal in some cases. So, um, you know, hemangioendothelioma is a complicated uh, thing that we don't have time to delve deeply into, but basically, it is a term for a, a different types of vascular tumors that are not like fully benign and not fully malignant. And But each one of those different types of hemangioendothelioma are totally unrelated to each other. They're not like morphologic variants of the same thing. They are all unique entities that get labeled hemangioendothelioma because they don't fit neatly into a benign or a malignant group. That, that's a, the simplest explanation I can give in a short time. So basically don't think like, oh, you know, there's just different flavors of hemangioendothelioma. No, each one is totally unique and separate. So some of them have, some types of hemangioendothelioma can, are called that because they can metastasize occasionally or be aggressive in other ways. This one basically never metastasizes or almost never. I think it can re involve regional nodes sometimes, but distant mets is basically not a problem with these to my knowledge. The bigger problem is that, that when patients have a problem with these or die from these, it's because they have really large ones and they have thrombocytopenia that's uncontrollable. So, so they're more of a, an issue with the outside of that setting. The issue is that if they're large, how do you manage them? Because you don't want to do like real extensive surgery if you don't have to. Um, and sometimes they can be pretty big. So um, th that's a much more complicated issue. Um, sometimes people have, have used different medications to try to manage these. And that's an area of growing interest. But diagnostically, how do we diagnose them? They're often uh, either a plaque, a violaceous or erythematous plaque, or a big nodule, depending and they have two main features, these, these blue cannonball-like nodules, which compose of compressed uh, cleft or slit-like vascular channels and spindled cells. Um, and then also in, a, in the background, dilated lymphatic channels and these irregular ectatic kind of branchy lymphatic channels. You can even see, look, little, little valves in there. Isn't that cool? So these, these look similar. If you didn't tell me any history and you just showed me this, I'd say maybe this is from a person who has lymphedema because this is the kind of vascular channel change you get in the, in the setting of lymphatic stasis, like lymphedema. So you get these dilated lymphatic channels and then these nodules here, and they're usually kind of multifocal and kind of infiltrating throughout the dermis and into the subcutis. Sometimes you can have larger, more cellular ones, but most of the ones I've seen have looked like this. All right. If we look closer at the vascular uh, channels here, they are they have, again, thin little compressed spaces and the endothelial cells can be a bit spindly. And there's also going to be some spindled pericytes in between. 
Um, and if you do a platelet stain, a CD61, in, particularly in the big cases in babies that have Casabac merit, you can actually see little platelets getting trapped in the middle of these little spaces. So that's kind of the idea of how the, the platelet trapping happens, okay? And the idea is that the name Kaposiform comes from the fact that, you know, this kind of slit-like spaces in spindle endothelial cells could, could vaguely resemble Kaposi sarcoma. The growth pattern here is not, to me, very typical of Kaposi sarcoma in most of the cases I've seen, but, but they can sometimes have areas that resemble Kaposi. But to me, this looks really nice for Kaposi form of angiothelioma, aka tufted angioma in this case.